Uh, we are living in the midst of a drought, uh, and a very bad drought, uh, that has had a negative effect on many mushrooms, especially ones like this and this and this, both of which are what's known as mycorrhizal. They're connecting underground to the roots of trees, and there's an exchange of nutrients. But when there's no rain, the leaves uh, and constant dryness and constant heat. The leaves are drying up. They're not able to relay any photosynthates to their roots. So the mushrooms aren't getting the energy they need, or the mycelium isn't getting the energy it needs <coughs> to form fruiting bodies. Thus, up until the last week or so, 95% of what we found, we found on wood because wood holds moisture better than the ground. Um, and one could argue that drought has uh, a connection with climate change and that the tr trees, uh, which are getting CO2 from the atmosphere and then passing it on to fungi, when they're not photosynthesizing, they're not getting CO2. So they're not passing it on to fungi. There are no fungi and the absence of fungi is uh, a statement that says, at least in these temperate regions, we're suffering from climate change. Having said that, here are two, we wouldn't have found these two weeks ago because there was rain here in Concord, two mycorrhizal species. These would not exist but for the fact that their underground part, mycelium, is connected with the roots of trees. This one, uh, Suelus granulatus, it's in the Bolete family, and it only grows with pines. Uh, in fact, all but one of the 50 or so species of Suelus grow with pines. So when you want to find a Suelus, you don't go into deciduous woods, you go into pine woods. Now, this is a species of Amanita that hasn't yet opened up. Uh, but when it does, the area, that what's connecting the cap with the stem, uh, as it opens, there will be a ring around the stem. That's how rings form. Some Amanitas don't have rings, most do, and one reason it's been speculated upon that they keep their rings is that that, that becomes uh, a, a sort of barrier to terrestrial insects who might want to climb up the stand, burrow into the gills, and thus interfere with the mushrooms sporulating. Um, now, here, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, if you can or can't, no matter, this has teeth. And you needn't worry, it's not going to bite you. Uh, it's an evolutionary adaptation that says, has the fungus saying, I can do a better job making and spreading my spores with these teeth than you guys with pores can do with your pores. And this is a poroid species. Or you guys, and this will be a guild species, can do with your gills. So, uh, I, I was looking for this species, which is Lacaria lacata, the common Lacaria, but the usual place it's found is in a lowland swampy area. And voila, we found a lowland swampy area that was wet, and there is an entire uh, colony of them here, uh, Lacaria lacata. Now, they're interesting. They're uh, pinkish on the underside, but they have white spores. And this is why it's necessary to do a spore print, because the spore color is not always the same color as the underside of a mushroom. Also, and guidebooks don't go into this very much, it's a hygrophonous species. What that means is when it loses water, it loses color. Um, and this is a fresh specimen. 
reddish, but it's, this one has lost a lot of its moisture in the cap, and it is, you can see that it's light, much lighter color, i.e. this is an example of hygrophorousness. Um, here is a polypore, and it confirms my feeling that the aerial view of a fungus is never enough. You have to look on the underside. Now, when you think polypore, you think, oh, underside, pores. Well, we look at the underside of this, and it has gills. And indeed, the common name of this is the gilled polypore. Um, Latin is Trimedes betulina, but uh, that suggests betulina birch, that it grows only on birch. Not the case. It grows only on deciduous wood. Whoever first ID'd it and called it betulina had found it on birch and decided that that would be a good species name for it. But again, have a look. It doesn't have pores. It has gills. Hence, Aerial view, not sufficient. Okay. This is Amanita muscaria variety gasoii, the east coast Amanita muscaria. The west coast one is red and is an iconic mushroom on postcards, in yards, and in Alice in Wonderland. It's what Alice ate that made her grow both bigger and smaller. In this case, in our case, it doesn't have the um, alkaloid in sufficient quantities to make you on the East Coast do much of anything. Um, so I would not recommend eating it for um, psychoactive purposes at all. Um, again, this is identifiable because it has scales on the bottom part of the stem. This is a very dried specimen, and warts on the cap. The warts are the remainder of a universal veil that connected the cap to the stem. And as the cap opened up like this, it, the top of it, the, the veil broke and left warts on the cap, as you can see here this desiccated specimen. Also the area connecting the cap with the stem became a ring, as you can see right here. Many Amanitas have bulbs at the base of their stems, and this is an example of that. Once again, uh, this is a mildly toxic mushroom, but I'm touching it, I'm wiping my mouth, you know, I'm going like this, and as you can tell, I'm not running off to wash my hands. Here we have a close relative to the Indian pipe. Uh, both are monotropes, as they're called. Uh, they're plants without chlorophyll. They can't photosynthesize. So how do they get their energy? In the case of this one, pine sap, the roots form an illegal hookup with the mycelia of what's called trichelomas. These are fall mushrooms. You typically will not see this until the fall. Um, trichelomas tend to be large and generic looking. The one that you might be familiar with, however, is Trichyloma magnivillare, which is otherwise known as Matsutake. Um, in any event, these extend into the mycelia and they take nutrients that are either being rooted to the tree from uh, the mycelium or from the tree roots, uh, thus making it easier for the mycelium to produce a fruiting body. It doesn't destroy the mycelium, it just plugs into it. It plugs into uh, its <clears throat> through the surface and gets the nutrients. So a way of describing it is illegal hookup. This is or was a bolete. Because this has been such a dry year, a lot of fungi don't have the defenses that they would have had in a 
normal year, with the result that parasitic fungi like this uh, can attack them. Parasites don't have problems with that, with, with say drought, except they indeed delight in it because that means they can uh, find more host than they would find in a normal year. And this is a, a bolete, uh, and it's a hypomyces. People, we say this has been hypoed. Uh, it's an ascomycete, uh, and that's different. Morels are also, so this is a relative of morel. And it starts out yellow and becomes white. And it eventually would cover the entire bolete, uh, sucking out its vitals. Okay, well, here we have what's called a coprophilus fungus. You find it on horse poop, moose poop, and several other types of poop. Uh, Peniolus semiovatus, uh, you could give it a common name, the poop inhabitor. Um, it's not found anywhere else. What happens is this, the uh, horse or moose eats the spores. They have a laminate on them that allows them to go through the system and not be digested. Then the spores come out in the poop. And so it's a kind of nutritious liquid environment that any self-respecting fungus would like. What's interesting about this is it might look tall, but it can get three times as tall. And if the the poop starts to move because of the weight of the fungus, it will grow in another direction to reorient it so the poop will not fall over because the last thing it wants is to be brought over on its side because it wants to drop its spores from a position like this. Uh, what we have here is a perenomycete, P-Y-R-E-N-O. If you know what a perenomaniac is, someone who uh, starts fires, uh, perennial means char. This looks like it's been charred, but it really hasn't been charred. That's the natural color, black. And it naturally grows in cracks like this. The Latin name is diatribe stigma. And typically it's a saprophyte recycling the wood. And it's not edible. It's not really charismatic. Sometimes it's not even included in books because of those two facts, but it's in extraordinarily interesting. Um, it's also an ascomycete. It's in a different phylum from most of what we've been talking about. Um, and so looking at this, you would be utterly surprised to find out that it is a close cousin of the morel. Uh, this is a, another monotrope. It's a plant that can't photosynthesize, has no chlorophyll, so it forms an illegal hookup with a mycelium. In this case, however, it's a different type of mycelium. It's my, the mycelium is in the Rusula family, and this is hooking up with it. And when you see Indian pipes, you know there's a Russula brevipes or another type of Russula in the vicinity in mycelial form. Often you don't see the fruiting body, but often you do. Uh, and again, as with the pine sap, it's not killing the fungus. It's just hooking up with it and taking some of the nutrients without permission. Okay. Um, now, what we have here is, well, I'm not exactly sure. I think it might be something called Seroporia purpurea, uh, a resupinate polypore that's purple, but I'm, I'm really not sure. But I'm saying this for a reason. Any mycologist who tells you he can identify anything that's shown him in the field, or who tries to identify anything in the field and gives a name, uh, puts a name on everything, is probably lying. Uh, I think I'm pretty good with 80% of what I find. Um, but 
hundred percent, no bloody way. What we have here is what's called a pigskin poison puffball. And it grows mycorrhizally, believe it or not, with trees in a particular area. And so you see the bottom of this will have mycelia extending to a nearby tree. Now, it is a toxic species. How do you tell it from non-toxic puffballs? One way is by cutting it open, and you'll see that the inside is black. It starts out being gray and then ends up being black like this. Uh, and that proclaims inedibility with respect to a puffball. Well, it's time for me to be a bit mercenary. I highly recommend this book, which happens to be mine. It's called Fungipedia. It was published last November by Princeton University Press. And as the subtitle says, it's a brief compendium of mushroom lore. So you can learn all about uh, the lives of eccentric mycologists. You can learn about Alice in Wonderland and her favorite mushroom. You can learn about uh, a fellow named Vaclav Halik, who was a Czech composer who would go into the woods, bend down and listen to the mushrooms because he believed that every mushroom had a song and a different song. And he would have a musical notebook and he'd put this notes in the song and he eventually published the music of mushrooms. And he indeed put them all together and composed what's called a Myco Symphony. Anyway, I highly recommend this book, uh, both for beginning mycophiles and individuals who in fact might know a bit about fungi. What you have here are, is a polypore called the turkey tails, Trimedes versicolor. It derives its common name from the fact that it, it looks like the flared tail of a tom turkey. And these are saprophytes, not parasites, they're digesting the, both the lignin and the cellulose in this branch. Usually, um, fungi are very competitive, especially in wood, and sometimes they will release, the mycelium will release chemicals that tell other mycelia, stay away, this is my meal. And turkey tails are very good at that. And often when you find turkey tails on a branch, you do not find any other fungi on that same branch. Um, so here they are. Admire them. This is what's known as a honey mushroom. And this refers not to its behavior, but to the usually honey color of its cap because its behavior is anything but honey-like. It could be a very serious parasite on living trees. Uh, the mycelium cuts off the connection between the roots and the trunk, uh, thus rendering the tree more or less defenseless against the invasion of the mycelium into that trunk from which it's getting its resources. Here um, it is not a parasite, it's probably a saprophyte, but one cannot be sure because one wasn't here at the time, but if you see this fallen tree it could be that a while back the mycelium uh, of the honey mushroom interfered with the roots and the trunk causing the tree to uh, become sick and unhealthy and eventually fall over. Um, it's hard to say because I don't know, but once you see the honey mushrooms at a certain site, like uh, at the base of a tree, you know that that tree is a goner.